All right, that's better. So this will bring us back to doing some Java programming. We're talking about errors. But I want to finish up our conversation about the internet because some of this is potentially useful for people as you start to work on your final project, which we released yesterday. All right, so, so last time we talked about the HTTP protocol, which allows clients to make requests from a web server and also to send data to the web server. Um, the World Wide Web that you experience in your browser mainly uses those requests to move around HTML, which describes the structure of a web page, CSS files, which tell the browser how the web page should look, and then JavaScript, right, which is this actual code that you can send around, right, which has, you know, completely changed the face of programming, right? They're probably, you know, the web is now probably the largest software distribution platform on Earth. You guys don't realize this, but Essentially, every time, or maybe you do realize it, but every time you go to a website, you are downloading and running a small piece of code, sometimes a massive piece of code, right? Um, but what we wanted to do is figure out, you know, how can we uh, use some of these web primitives in order to build an API that a programmer could use? So if I have a device and I want to query some information from a server that it might know that I don't, like what's the weather in my area or something like that, or I wanted to get it to do something for me that I'm not capable of. Um, one of the APIs that we've used in the past, we didn't use this here as part of the MP, um, is that Microsoft provides a nice web API for doing um, computer vision. So you can essentially take a photo from your Android phone, upload it to uh, Microsoft's, what they call their Cognitive Services API. Oh, there it is. Um, and it will send you back information about the picture. It can do things like, identify faces, identify celebrities in a photo, provide tags that are appropriate, like cat or dog or tree, park, whatever. It can actually auto-generate a caption for the picture. This is all done using machine learning, um, which is pretty cool. So, but how do we actually implement this type of thing over the web, right? Uh, so we talked about what an API was a little bit last time. This is uh, an interface that something provides that's designed for you, the application programmer, to use. So again, you know, if you were building an app that did something cool with photos, you could spend, you know, months and months trying to re-implement state-of-the-art computer vision techniques and get them to run efficiently on this fairly small device, or you could pay Microsoft a little bit of money and say, you know what, you guys have been working on this problem for decades, and you have this massive cloud full of servers that are there to help me, I'll just upload the picture to you and allow you to do the work, right? And you also benefit from a massive training data set, you have lots of pictures that you've already trained your models on and stuff like that. Now this is very, very often the right thing to do. All right, so actually how do we, how do we make this work? And we started to talk about an example using a simple weather API. So imagine I wanna be able to query the weather at a given location. So essentially this is what it might look like in Java. I need to figure out, you know, what information do I need to provide to the server in order to ask for weather, right? Some information about my location. Um, and then I might need a way to query that based on a string that the user would provide. So this was our simple API uh, for getting and retrieving weather info, right? And it's actually based on an actual weather API. Right? I didn't make this up. All right, so now let's think about, you know, how do we get this to work over the internet, over the web? Now keep in mind that you can send data to a web server, right? And there's a couple of different ways to do that. I'm not gonna go into them in detail. Post is the HTTP request that actually allows you to send a large chunk of data, but there's also a way to um, add query parameters to a GET request. And you guys may have seen this before in your browser, right? You see the URL of the page, and then there's a question mark, and then there's a series of um, key value pairs separated by ampersand. So there's like key is equal to value, key one is equal to value one. Those tell the web server something about your request, and it uses that to figure out what data it's actually going to send you. Okay, so that's another way that I can provide information along with my request. So that's the first ingredient, is I can make queries using the web. The server can run code. The server takes my request, and it can do all sorts of interesting stuff, right? It doesn't have to just send me back static information. When you use a web API like the Cognitive Services API or other uh, internet APIs that are out there, um, you know, there's actually a lot of processing involved in answering each request. It's the same thing with Google, right? You do a Google search, there's work that gets done, right, on Google servers to figure out what results to send you. And, you know, it's actually kind of incredible that that happens so fast now 
that Google is able to support things like live query, right? So as you're typing, it's actually repeating the search over and over and over again so fast that it's allowed, it can actually auto-generate suggestions for you. And then it can, it can tell you what it found, right? And the critical part here is that the data sent back from a web server does not have to be an HTML document. It can be anything, right? Um, and all of this works nicely with these firewalls that the computer security people uh, have set up, you know, that block a lot of custom protocols that you might otherwise want to use across the internet. All right, so I'm just gonna go through this quickly. Um, so, you know, here, there are several ways that we could provide the information to the server that we need. So essentially, I need to pass an argument across the web. If I was doing this in my code, I would just call the function and provide a reference to an object of type weather location, or something that could be cast to the weather location. If I'm doing this over the web, there's a couple of different ways I can do this. So I can jam it into the URL in some way, right, depending on what the web server wants, right? Um, I could add it as a query parameter. So I said before, when you guys are browsing online, you probably see this pattern, where I have the root of my web query, and then I have a, a question mark, and then I have some information that follows that. So that allows me to provide custom information uh, as part of my request. I can also use post. So the first two work if I'm making a get request. Once I'm making a post request, I'm using an HTTP request type that's explicitly designed for me to be able to send data to the server, right? So now I can just stick it in the body of my request, maybe as a JSON object, right? So here's another way to do it. These will all work, okay? Now, what do you get back? And again, this is gonna be useful for you, and I'm, I'm happy that you guys have done this machine project because I think you've worked with this a little bit already, which is awesome, right? Using our API, right? So we've set up an API for use as part of the machine project, and one of the parts of the assignment was to integrate with that. So you guys have done this already. Um, what do you get back? Um, again, a web server, a web API can send you back whatever it wants, but a common format that's used for this type of data exchange today is JSON. You guys are already familiar with JSON, I'm not gonna go into it, um, but this is a nice way to send back structured data that the client can then use. And this is an actual piece of JSON that I queried from some weather API. So I figured out how to make a request to it, and this is what it sent back to me, and this document goes on and on, right? There's actually a lot of information that's contained in this document, uh, but you can see things like, you know, here's what's going on at the time I made the request, right? So if you use a weather application, on your phone, as many of you do, or you have that little weather summary that's up in the status bar, this is how it works internally. From time to time, it makes some request to a web API that knows about the weather. It includes information in the request that tells the web API where it is, and then the web API sends back something that looks like this, which is parsed by the app or by the little status bar, and then it, it puts in big letters, thunder. That's the summary of the weather in your area, right? This is how this works in turn. What's cool about this, and what we hope you guys will explore as part of, part of your final project, is that there are a lot of public web APIs out there. This link takes you to um, a curated list of public web APIs, where you can query information about things. Now, some of them may require you to create an account, some of them may require you to um, sign up for a free plan that might eventually convert to a paid plan if you make too many requests or whatever. Um, but a lot of them, particularly when you're getting started, want you to use them, right? You know, they, they, this is marketing, right? They want you to use their API, and then when your app gets really popular and a billion people are using it, then they're gonna come at you and they're gonna want a little kickback, right? Uh, because you'll be making a lot of requests. All right, any questions about this stuff before we go on? Just had a little bit of hanging content here that we needed to do before we switch gears entirely and talk about errors. Yeah. Is there, ah, okay, great question. Is there something that's gonna replace the packet system? N I don't think so. Um, there is, however, you know, I mentioned before, there's work being done on these lower level internet protocols. So I don't wanna, I, I could talk about this for a long time, and if you come to office hours, I, I will be happy to talk about it for a long time, but for a long time, the core internet protocols that provided reliable transmission were pretty well understood. Um, and then recently, you know, Google is involved in this effort, but there's some other people that are doing this, and there's a standardization effort underway uh, to rethink how some of those protocols work, because it turns out they don't work very well, particularly when you start to use wireless, 
right? So there is some foundational work going on in reshaping the internet, but I think packetization has proved to be invaluable, right? I don't think that's going anywhere. The internet is one of those things that, you know, you should be really feel blessed to have in your life. Because if we designed the internet 10 times, we would only get it this right once. Like, I, sometimes I would go to conferences, but you know, before when I was doing research in this area, and people would be like, oh, the future of the internet, we're gonna redesign it. And you're like, no, you're not. First of all, it's too big to redesign. Second of all, you will never get it right again. You know, we got so lucky in terms of how it evolved. Um, and if you look at other types of technology, if you look at what happens with streaming, if you look at Bluetooth, like, we could have had the Bluetooth internet, right? And, you know, I don't want to throw too much shade at Bluetooth, but it still confuses me every time I get in my car and it takes my phone, like, five minutes to pair with the, the device in there, right? It's like, something is wrong. Um, but yeah, I mean, the fact that the internet was really designed by students, um, by people that didn't have a big financial stake in it, a lot of the people that made core contributions to the internet you have never heard of. You probably only saw Vint Cerf face for the first time on my slides. He's not famous, probably not. He might be a little rich, he works at Google, right? But, um, but some of these people that did foundational work into some of these technologies um, are unheralded engineers that weren't in it for money, they were in it because they were really curious about making something like this work, and what we got is something that works really well um, and has served as a platform for a lot of innovation. So, so again, this is one of those things to thank your lucky stars for, feel grateful about. Any other questions? Those are great questions. Okay, let's talk about exceptions. All right, so now we're gonna change gears again, we're gonna go back to doing some Java. There's a piece of Java that we haven't explored yet, and this is a pretty important part. Hey guys over there, can we not talk throughout the entire class? There's other people around you that are trying to listen. Thanks. All right, so, what do you do when your program encounters some sort of unexpected situation, right? This could be an error, could be an unexpected condition. Um, you know, what do you do when things go wrong, okay? We've seen a couple of these scenarios before, and we haven't known what to do about it. We've sort of punted, you know? It's like, well, if the user passes a bad argument to my constructor, I won't just, I just won't initialize the, the object properly, right? So again, what did we do here before? I'm creating a class to store things, you give me a negative argument, um, there's no way in Java to prevent that, because ints can be both positive and negative, so you can pass me a negative argument, and what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to interpret that? You know, there's really, up until this point, there's really been no good answer. We've said, well, we could create an empty storage class, or we could, I don't know, I can't return null, it's a constructor, it has to succeed. What do I do here, right? Um, and then there are other cases, right? So sometimes, so this is a case where the error is because the, u because the programmer who used your code did something dumb, okay? That's one kind of error. But remember that there are these human beings that are gonna be using the things that you've created and they don't always do the right thing. There was actually an example of this in the coder's book, right? Where, you know, he's talking about writing a program, it's like enter your favorite color or something like that and people put in these stupid answers, right? So imagine you're taking, you need like an integer value that you're accepting from the user through your UI and they give you something that's like wrong, right? They just got confused, they, you know, they entered foo, whatever. Um, people do this, people make mistakes, right? Could be your fault, it could be the UI needs to be better, and the user just might have fat fingered something, right? Or not read it carefully. So what do we do here? What do we do when the error comes in from the outside? Um, so Java has a structure for this. This is one of the pieces of Java syntax we have not talked about yet. And it's interesting, right? Um, in the sense that it introduces some new ideas in terms of how our programs execute that we're gonna have to think about. So what Java, and this is not an unusual language construct, it's present in several other languages, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, Java uses uh, what's called a try-catch block to handle, allow you to handle exceptions. And we're gonna talk about how this works. But the general idea here is that it allows me to set up two blocks of code, okay? At least two, if not more. 
there's one block of code that I run that could potentially cause a problem. And then there's another chunk of code that gets run if that code fails. All right? So, as, you know, so essentially I'm trying something, right? I'm gonna try to do something, it might fail. And the catch here relates to the other piece of this system, which we're not looking at yet, which is a, which is a control statement called throw, right? So if the code that I run inside the try block throws an exception, I can catch it in this block of code, all right? And this is like any other control structure we've used. You can put anything you want inside the try block, if statements, loops, calls to other functions, whatever. Um, and you can put anything in the catch block that you want, right? There's, there's no rules about what goes in here, right? Uh, the, the semantics are associated with what happens when there's an error, okay? All right, so let's talk a little bit about catch. So what you can see here is that my catch block, and this is required, takes an argument. Okay, in order to, in order to declare a catch block, I have to tell Java what kind of exceptions this code should catch. This code is gonna run when a certain type of problem happens, and the way I do that is I pass a, uh, type and an argument, and that, um, this, this variable here is gonna be set, this is a reference variable, it's gonna be set to refer to the exception that happened if one took place, all right? And here what I'm saying is, I'm gonna catch anything that's an exception, and anything that's in inherits from exception. So this is a Java type. One of the cool things about Java is that exceptions are just objects. You know, one of my favorite homework problems is this week, it's actually gonna force you to think about that, right? Because it's gonna force you to return an exception like an object, because you can do that. You can create an exception in Java, you can pass it around like it's any other type of object, like a string or whatever, okay? Exceptions are just objects. And like other Java objects, they have state, they have an inheritance structure and things like that, all right? So when, as soon as, so here's what happens. I run the code inside the try block. As soon as there's a problem, as soon as anything in there throws an exception, I start, Java starts looking at the catch blocks for a one that's set up to handle this type of exception, okay? Right, so I'm gonna, and I'll try them in order. So I essentially start at the first one, I can have multiple catch blocks, and I keep going until I find a catch block that matches the exception that was thrown. And at that point, I start running the code in there. Now this is what's different about this, okay? Because try-catch is an exception handling mechanism, but it's also a control structure. It introduces a new type of control flow or program execution flow that we're not familiar with, right? So as soon as the code inside the try block throws an exception, the rest of that code is not executed. Execution immediately jumps into the catch handler, okay? So as soon as try does something bad, the catch block starts to run. And its job is basically to clean up the mess, to figure out what to do, because something that I was trying caused a problem, okay? So here's an example, and some of these exception types are probably gonna look familiar to you. You guys may have seen these in error messages, either on the playground or um, in Prairie Learn or whatever. Um, you know, these are probably gonna, you know, conjure up bad memories of problems that you had with the MP or something like that, okay? So a null pointer exception. This is a type of Java exception. It inherits from exception. Exception is the parent class of all these exceptions we're gonna talk about. So a null pointer exception is thrown when your code tries to use a null pointer. So if you have a reference that's null, sorry, it should really be null reference exception, right? If you have a Java reference variable that's set to null and you try to dereference it, you're gonna get this null pointer exception. The pointer in here is a forward reference to things you guys will learn about once you start using um, slightly lower level languages like C++, okay? Um, but you can think of it, I had a reference that was null and I tried to use it, okay? That's going to throw a null pointer exception. Array index out of bounds exception, you guys have seen this one as well. This says I tried to use an index that wasn't valid for the array because it was out of bounds. It could have been negative or it could have been off the end, right? So I had an array with four elements and I tried to access, you know, bracket four, it's off the end of the array, that throws an array index out of bound exception, okay? There is syntax for handling multiple types of exceptions in one catch statement. 
there it is, right? So you put a pipe between them. Now this catch statement will handle either a null pointer exception or an illegal argument exception. And you can chain multiple of these together. So as I mentioned a minute ago, try and catch is not an unusual control structure. You're gonna see this in other languages. Python has it. Um, JavaScript has it. C++ has it, I think. Um, this is just not an unusual way to deal with exceptions. So it looks a little bit different depending on the language you're using. So here's what it looks like in Python. Uh, here's what it looks like in JavaScript. Um, JavaScript has a f idea of finally, which is code that was also run. Uh, Java also has that, actually. Um, so understanding how to use this is going to, um, is going to allow you to think about how you handle errors and exceptions in other languages you use in the future. Okay, so let's, let's experiment with this a little bit. All right, so what do I have here? I have a little piece of Java code. And we're back in our, I'm, I'm back in the playground that allows me to experiment with loose code and top level functions, right? So, um, and I've got a new uh, piece of syntax here that we'll talk about in a minute, right? So I'm declaring a function called throws random error. And that function, I'm declaring that it throws an exception. Let's see what happens if we just run this, right? Um, okay. Now let's, let's see, um, you know, wh what is this doing, okay? We've seen aspects of this before, so I'm essentially, I'm using Java's random, uh, built-in random, uh, object generator to generate a Boolean. And then depending on that Boolean, I'm either gonna do one of two things. I'm either going to, uh, dereference a null object, which is what's happening on line six and seven, or, let's see if I can get it to do the other thing, or I'm going to, half the time I'm gonna do the null reference, the other half the time I'm gonna end up in line nine, I'm gonna create an array with four elements, and I'm gonna try to access the element that's right off the end of it. Okay? So now let's see, so right now what's happening is that nothing, so if nothing, so you might ask this question, what happens if nothing catches an exception? Okay? If nothing catches an exception in your program, it crashes. And it, it crashes with something that looks something like this. So if something in your code throws an exception, and there's, it's not inside a catch block, and we'll look a little bit, we can actually nest catch blocks together. So I can have code that runs inside a catch block, that runs inside another catch block, that runs inside another catch block, right? But when an exception is thrown, Java looks for a catch block. It essentially looks to see if the exception was thrown inside any catch block that can handle it. If it doesn't find one, your program will crash. And you'll get an error message something like this, right? It gives you the exception, there's a little error message that comes along with it, and then a stack trace indicating what happened. So our goal here is to see if we can get this to not fail, okay? So let's use this try catch idea that we just learned about, okay? Now what am I gonna catch here? So for the first time, let's just catch exception. This is going to catch any exception type. And I don't have to, here, let's do this. Put a print statement here. All right. Okay, so now what's, now what's happening? All right, so I, I wanna point out two things. So, first of all, that print statement will never be executed. Right, why not? Well, throw random error always generates an exception. The type of the exception varies depending on the value of this random Boolean. Sometimes I do a null pointer exception, sometimes I get an array on index out of bounds exception, but I'm always gonna throw an exception. So I'm never going to get to line 17. Okay, just to prove that this is actually being executed, let me put a statement above it. So that statement will get executed, but I'm never going to get to line 19. Now again, this is, a, this is different, and this is something that you're gonna have to think about as a program. It challenges, you know, our linear thinking about how programs execute. Up until this point, if you saw line 17, you would always assume that line 18 would be executed next, right? There's no if, you know, there's no return, like I execute line 17 and then I execute line 18 and then I move on, right? But as soon as an exception is thrown, I jump into the exception handler. All right, so let's put some code in the exception handler. Let's just print the exception, okay? 
So now what you can see is you actually see something that looks a lot like the error message, but, but the program didn't crash, right? The reason I'm seeing this is because I'm printing off the exception. Exceptions in Java are objects. They can be printed like anything else. And the, um, the message that I get depends on what type of exception this little function threw. If it threw an array index out of bounds exception, it actually gives me a nice error message that tells me, you know, both the length of the array and the index I tried to use, which is pretty useful for debugging. If I get a null uh, pointer exception, I don't get any additional information. Right. So now let's change this to only catch one type of exception. Right, so now what's gonna happen? So now there's no catch block for array index out of bounds exceptions. There's only a catch block for null pointer exceptions. So when I get an array index out of bounds exception, the program will crash. When I get a null pointer exception, and let me just take out this print lens so we can kind of see the difference more clearly, okay? You know, half the time, when I get a null pointer exception, it's caught and I'm good, right? Null pointer exception, um, the array index out of bounds exception, it's not. Any questions about this? You know, so, so thinking about what happens when exceptions is, are thrown, it's really important to understanding how to think about how Java code executes. This is particularly true when you call a function. When you call another function, particularly if it's in a library or in some code you didn't write, you have no idea what's going on in there. That function could crash, that function could throw an exception, you're not sure what's gonna happen, okay? All right, so again, just to, just to drive this point home, because I think this is one of the more, more difficult things to understand when you're thinking about exceptions. When an exception happens, control flow immediately jumps into the enclosing catch statement if I can find one. So Java looks for a catch statement that can catch that type of exception, okay? And even if I've called a function that's called a function that's called another function, I will keep unwinding, this is called unwinding the stack. I keep essentially going up the stack, so I go from the function that was called to the caller to the caller, looking for the thing that, uh, something that can catch this exception. So what's gonna happen here in this piece of code? So let's say that I start in foo4, okay? That's the function that gets called first. Foo four calls foo three inside a try catch block. Foo three, sorry, yeah, foo three calls foo two, which calls foo one, which generates a null pointer exception. So what Java's gonna do is when foo one generates a null pointer exception, it's gonna say, is there a try catch block inside foo one? The answer is no, okay? But foo one was called by foo two. So Java now looks in foo two and says there's the try catch block there. The answer is no. But foo2 was called by foo3. Is there a try catch block in foo3? No. But foo3 was called by foo4. Is there a try catch block there? And can it catch this kind of exception? The answer is yes, there's a try catch block. And it's configured, it's been configured to um, catch this type of exception. So essentially what'll happen is execution will start here, it'll run foo2, it'll run foo1, it'll get to foo1, it'll throw an exception. That exception will go up through foo2, back to foo3, back to foo4, and end up in the catch handler that foo4 set up. Okay? Yeah. Sometimes, so the question is like, what goes inside try? Anything. Yeah, for this example, I just ran a function, right? But you can put any code that could potentially generate an exception. Yeah. Great question. All right, so again, here, here's my example, right? And what you're gonna see is that, um, let me put a print statement in here. All right, so it's, it's caught in foo4, right? Now, let's put a print statement here just so I can convince you that foo1 ran. Yeah, and I can move this if I put this here. Let's put it in foo2 so I know foo2 ran, let's put it in foo3, so I know foo3 ran. Yep, so I start with foo3, foo3 calls foo2, foo2 calls foo1, foo1 generates an exception, and I don't, I don't execute the code underneath foo1, I don't execute any code underneath foo2, I just go straight up until I find the thing that th 
through the, ex uh, something that can catch this exception, right? So now let's think about, let, let's, let's try this, right? So imagine that foo2 has a try-catch block that it's using to call foo1, but let's imagine that that catch block is configured to catch an array index out of bounds exception, okay? So now what's gonna happen? So now I have a try-catch block in foo2. Oh, check styles angry with me. There we go. All right. But I'm still going all the way up to foo4. Why? Because that catch statement wasn't set up properly to catch this type of exception. What's being thrown is a null pointer exception. But this is designed to handle an array index out of bounds exception. So let's replace this with a null pointer exception. And now what you're gonna see is that that caught statement doesn't execute anymore. So as soon as I find a catch block, Java stops looking. So what it happened here is it found the catch block in foo2, and it said, okay, well foo2 told me what to do if foo1 generated a null pointer exception, and what to do is nothing. There's nothing in the catch block. That's usually not the right thing to do. Usually you need to do something about the problem, uh, but this is just for an example so that we can see what happens. All right, any questions about this control flow bit before we talk a little bit about Java's different types of exceptions in Java? Okay. So Java breaks exceptions into three categories, okay? And this is actually reflected in Java's uh, type system. So if you look at exceptions, there's actually a, a superclass of all these called throwable. That's anything that you can put in a throw statement. We'll talk about throw in a little bit. That's how you generate exceptions. Um, but Java's type system breaks exceptions into three different categories. And this is important because this affects how you use things as a program. Okay. So the first one is checked exceptions. Okay. Checked exceptions are so named because, first of all, these are for places where you know something might go wrong and you need to find a way to signal that to whoever is using your code. Right. So for example, let's say you have a library uh, for providing the weather it uses a network API. But let's say that the network is down. The user doesn't have a network connection. And someone says, what's the weather right now? Well, there's nothing really to do, right? I mean, you can't lie. You're like, it's sunny out, 95. Um, you don't want to return something old. Maybe they've never called before. So it's like, what's the right thing here, right? If I don't have a network connection and I need to use a network API, the right thing to do is probably to throw some type of exception that says the network is down right now. I don't have any information for you, okay? The other reason the checked exceptions are called checked exceptions is the compiler is gonna force you to check them. It's gonna force you to handle them. So I don't know if any of you have experienced this yet, but you might when you're working on your final project. If you try to use an external library, you may call a function in that library and think, you know, this is great. And the Android Studio is gonna complain. It's gonna say, this might generate this type of exception and you need to handle it. So here the compiler is also helping you when you use code that use checked exceptions to handle them, right? So when you're using that library that needs network access and you try to call the function to retrieve the weather, uh, the compiler is gonna basically tell you, if you call this function, you have to be prepared for what you're going to do if it throws a no network exception or something like that, right? You need to have a way to handle that, right? Okay, so unchecked exceptions. The ones we've been looking at so far are unchecked exceptions. And these are basically, so, so the idea with a checked exception is, I know something might go wrong, and I'm prepared to handle it. Checked exceptions, unchecked exceptions are cases where normally you did something dumb, okay? So the idea is like, how would you check for null pointer uh, exceptions? Well, you shouldn't do that, right? Like, this is your fault. It's not something that happened in the world, right? It's like the network is down, therefore I must generate a null pointer exception, right? That's, that's wrong, that's a programmer error. Array index out of bounds is a programmer error, right? These are examples of cases where it's your fault and you should fix your code. Ah, stop that. So the idea here is that there's no way for the compiler to check for these. It would like to if it could, but really the only way to do this is to run the code because it doesn't know, again, we already know that the Java compiler isn't super smart, and so it'll allow me to do things, 
oops, sorry, wrong direction. I mean, the Java compiler is so dumb that I can do this example, right? I can set an object reference to null, and then I can immediately try to dereference it in the next line. And Java's like, okay. I hope that works out, right? Um, so that's an example of an unchecked exception. All right, the final category, and these are not ones we're gonna talk about in detail, are errors, okay? And errors are reserved for, like, serious system problems that you probably can't recover from. There are some errors you can recover from, right? But this is like the Java program ran out of memory. Or stack overflow. You guys probably saw some of these when you were working on recursion, right? You've used, you've called the function so many times that Java has finally decided that something is wrong and it's going to stop you. And at that point, it's like, I have no idea what to do now, right? Your recursive code lacks a base case, and it's now called itself a thousand times, right? I don't see a way forward for this situation, right? It's just like, I'm just gonna crash, uh, because that's probably the right thing to do. All right. So again, checked exceptions are for cases normally where there's some sort of external condition in the world that can affect the correctness of the behavior of your program, right? So for example, let's say your program needs to read data from a file. What happens if that file isn't there? Like the user went poking around, you know, in the directories you were using and deleted the file, and now your program doesn't know what to do, right? Um, you know, you were trying to use a particular resource and the syntax didn't work properly. These are actual Java exceptions, right, that I pulled out, right? So, so, here, so here's an example, and again, I wanna show, I wanna use this to show you a little bit about the inheritance relationship here, right? In Java, this is important to remember, exceptions are objects, and they're part of Java's object tree. So here's my URI syntax exception. It inherits from exception. That inherits from throwable. Again, that's that parent category that indicates anything that I can throw. And every throwable inherits from object. So this is kind of nice, because exceptions are just objects, and I can work with them like I work with other objects. They can be arguments and functions. You can create them yourself. You can create new types of exceptions. That's frequently appropriate when you're writing a, a library or a new piece of code. All right, so when you use something that generates a checked exception, the compiler is gonna make sure that you wrap it in a try-catch block. So again, this is an exception the compiler is going to check for you. It's gonna check to make sure that you are handling it, right? So when I create, this is an example I chose for, for you know, for this, for this, um, this class, right? So when I create a, so this is thing called a URI that essentially usually contains like a URL or some resource that has a particular syntax. Uh, when I create one, it's possible that the act of creating it, if I give it a bad input, it's going to throw an exception. This can happen in the constructor. So when I create one, Java's actually going to insist that I put this code inside a try-catch block because it's forcing me to handle the case where your input is bad, okay? So let's say I give you a string that doesn't create, contain a valid URI, what are you going to do? Because, and this is actually a nice example of a problem we had encountered earlier. What do I do in the constructor if you give me a bad input? What URI does is it throws an exception, the URI syntax exception. All right, so let's, let's see this in action, okay? All right, so, so here's my create URI function, okay? And again, if I try to compile this without handling the error, I'm gonna get a compiler error, right? So essentially, the compiler is telling me there's, a un there's an exception of type URI syntax exception, and you have to catch it, right? And it's actually telling me I have two options, and we'll talk about throw on Friday, right? I have two options. I can either catch it, or if I don't know what to do about it, I can actually have my function throw it, right? So there, whenever you're working with exceptions in Java, I can catch them if I know how to handle it, or I can say, I don't know how to handle it, and my function is now gonna th potentially throw that exception, and now it's somebody else's problem, right? Whoever called me has to figure out what to do. But for now, let's do what it's suggesting. So let's put our, let's put this inside a try-catch block. We're gonna catch the URI syntax exception that it wants me to catch. And for now, let's just leave this blank. Um, uh, oh, did I misspell it? Uh, hold on, let me, let me 
was telling me what to use a minute ago. I, I think I think this is. It seems like this has been renamed. URI syntax exception. Can I not spell? Oh, sorry. Need to import Java.net. All right. It used to be in a different package. Uh, I need I need my try statement back. Uh oh. Struggling. Oh, right, I need to return something. Okay, so now what do I do? So now it's my problem, right? So now what the compiler is complaining about is like, hey, you didn't return anything. So let's just return null. All right, good. So now this code can compile and run, right? Because essentially what I'm doing is the URI class is saying, here's what happens when something goes wrong. I throw this kind of exception. And my code is now prepared to handle that. Now, I don't think I'm handling it in a particularly good way, but I am doing something about it, right? So now let's try to figure out how we can get this into the catch block. Um, bad input. We'll put input in there. And now I'm trying to remember what. The problem is that there's a lot of things that are valid URIs, yeah. Maybe that. There we go. Okay. So here's an example of a bad input, right? This is something that starts off looking like it's gonna be an internet HTTP protocol address, and then has nothing, there's no uh, host, there's no path, right? So this is bad, okay? So now what's happening, and you can imagine, you know, what would you do about this in your Android application? Maybe you have a little pop-up message. Maybe this is coming from the user, right? You're asking them to enter a link to something, like a photo, okay? And your little pop-up message might say, you know, this is an invalid link, and then reset the form and allow them to try again. But it's my job to catch this. Okay. So second category, unchecked exceptions. Again, these are the these are the result of programmer error. And as a result, the compiler can't help you here, right? So with the checked exception, the compiler can help you because somebody said a, something might go wrong. With an unchecked exception, it's like this is on you to fix. I don't know if that array, I don't know if the index you're using for that array is correct or not. You better figure that out. If you don't, you're gonna have this problem, okay? So again, we've talked about some of these already, array index out of bounds exceptions, uh, null pointer exceptions, class cast, remember these? Uh, if I try to class, to cast something to, um, if I try to do a downcast that doesn't work, right? I try to cast something to something that's not in its inheritance tree, right? So you get a class cast exception, a legal argument exceptions. Um, this is a great one to use in your own code. So Java actually has an exception type that's designed for cases where I tried to create an instance of your object and I passed you a bad argument. You throw in a legal argument exception, okay? And again, you can, so here's the thing. You can catch these. You just don't have to, okay? And you also don't have to declare that you threw them, right? So let's try to do a class cast exception here. Let's say object i is equal to new object. And then let's say string s is equal to, I'm gonna downcast my object. This is not going to work. Oh, it doesn't like this. Oh, check style, relax. Let's take this out. Use that in a minute if we need it. Yeah, so now I'm down here in my class cast exception, right? Now again, f my function does not have to declare that it throws the exception, and I don't have to, ca I don't have to catch this. Right, so let's take this out and see what happens. So imagine I don't catch this error. What's gonna happen? The program's gonna crash. But there's no way the compiler can help me here. The compiler doesn't know enough about my program to figure out that I just did something wrong, right? And so it can't force me to handle it, um, and it can't force me to declare that it could potentially happen. Right? Again, this is an example of, of an exception that's generated by programmer error. Now, you don't have to declare that you throw these when you write code, and you also don't have to, uh, you don't have to handle them, but you can handle them, okay? There are cases where it's actually the right thing to do, and we'll talk a little bit about these on Friday when we talk about how you can use exception handling to simplify some code that you might write. Right. So you can handle, you can uh, catch and handle these unchecked exceptions. And like I said, there are cases where it's kind of nice to do that, right? So imagine you're working on your final project, and about like 10% of the time, the code that your partner wrote throws a no pointer exception, 
and you don't know how to fix it, it's this whole horrible piece of spaghetti code or whatever, um, just catch it. It's like, whatever, you know? I don't know, I don't know what to do down in the uh, catch block, right? But I can certainly probably do something better than having the program crash. Usually not something that users like. All right. So let me, I'll, I'll finish up today by just talking about, you know, errors and then a, a few other things. So errors are not so, what, somewhere where we're going to dwell. These are normally not recoverable. You can catch these in your code. It's not clear that there's always anything to do about it. Right, so again, if your program ran out of memory, it's probably about to crash. There's not a lot you can do at that point, right? Um, if you recursed infinitely, again, what are you going to do? You can't stop that recursion, it's kind of out of control. I don't know, start over, rewrite the code, basically. Um, a lot of these are typically still your fault, right? Um, but, you know, the, the difference here is that these are more serious conditions, right? The exceptions that we talked about, the, even the unchecked exceptions, sometimes those are worth catching because you can actually do something reasonable. Um, errors uh, frequently don't, don't bother. All right, so, so let's just finish up by talking about different strategies for dealing with these types of exceptions, okay? Errors, like I just said, don't bother, right? There's nothing that's, there's usually not much you can do there, a program is gonna crash. Unchecked exceptions, you know, these, this is why we run tests, right? This is why we experiment with our apps before we deploy them to people, right? Because this is what causes, you know, how many people have had, like, you know, your app is stopped or whatever, like that fun message that gets thrown up by Android? Like, that is not a fun thing for a user to see, okay? So this is why we run tests. We try to improve our code and make sure that we uh, avoid these when we're writing code, right? Checked exceptions, happily here, you get a lot of help from the compiler, right? So the compiler is going to suggest, it's gonna make sure that you catch them, you wrap them in a try-catch block. What you do then is then a little bit tricky, okay? And, and, and some of you are probably thinking, well, you know, we spent this whole class talking about try-catch, but I have no idea what to put in the catch block, right? And that's because there, you know, sometimes there's an obvious thing to do, pop up an error message and try again, sometimes there isn't, right? So this really becomes very program specific, right? If you can, you know, I mean, your goal here is to prevent the program from crashing and allow it to continue to make forward progress in some way, right? All right, so just as a final note, exceptions are another type of Java object. You can print them, you can, um, they have a get message function that returns a message associated with this exception. And then probably one of the more useful things that exceptions have is this print stack trace method. If you call this, this will show you how your code got to this point. It will show you all the traces of different functions that got called that what left you there. Okay, I am, I think this is a good stopping point. Let me see where I am. Okay, yes, we'll talk about throw on Friday. All right, we do have class on Friday. Um, if you're not here, the video will be up, it's not a big deal. Um, the final project is out. This is actually a pretty critical week. One of the most important things you guys have to do before you leave for break is find a partner. Because 10% of the final project grade is gonna be assessed on Tuesday when you guys get back from break. So you need to do a little bit of work this week on the final project to make sure you don't lose those points, all right? I have office hours today at one. I hope some of you will come by. I will see you on Friday.